Well, um, when I was in college at uh, Chico State University in California, I began taking courses uh, in my double major, psychology and religious studies. And uh, at the time, I was a devout uh, evangelical Christian. And I began to uh, read about the Hebrew prophets in the Hebrew Bible, what Christians refer to as the Old Testament. And they were often speaking out strongly about social injustice, about the lack of care for the disadvantaged and the poor. And that raised a question for me, why is it that I've been involved in this uh, evangelical Christian subculture and have never heard anything about that. In another course, I learned about a, a movement known as liberation theology, in which Christians, mostly Catholic but some Protestants, had become involved in social struggles for uh, social justice to overturn oligarchies. Uh, sometimes even rising up in uh, revolutions to overturn regimes that they considered to be despotic. From there I became interested in the power of religion for uh, both good and ill. Uh, some of those revolutionary movements were not ones that we would uh, consider to be positive. Um, some took on slogans like, the nature of a revolutionary is love, and tried to foment a revolution that would lead to both peace and social justice uh, even after the turmoil. But I became very interested in the religion variable in social movements and the possibility of social change. This drew me to pursuing a PhD in social ethics at the University of Southern California. Um, and Partway through that PhD program, I begin to, began to wonder why is this kind of liberationist motif, this kind of uh, struggle for liberation that many people around the world were advancing, why did it have nothing to do with the sharp decline in biological diversity around the world? Why was there almost no environmental dimension to it? And so in the mid-80s, I began to notice uh, living in Southern California, efforts to sabotage the Barstow to Las Vegas desert race. And activists out there in the desert were uh, arguing that the desert is not just a wasteland. The desert is a biological community with many plants and animals that have value, whether or not we even know they're there, because they only come out at night, whether or not they're valuable to us in some way. And that for some reason made sense to me, that all life has a right to be here, and that humans were not the only organisms on the planet that uh, had any value. Well, those activists were operating under a banner of a new group that began in 1980 known as Earth First, and this was the first movement I encountered that was expressing kind of liberationist motif for nature itself. It's represented even in its, its own title. And given my interest in religion and politics and the possibility of religion playing into social change, uh, my attention perked up when I discerned that there was a, uh, a spiritual dimension to what was animating these activists, activists who were willing to break the law and risks their freedom in the interests of these species that they uh, knew to be in danger. So I began to think more and more about the religion variable in environmental mobilization, and I had the opportunity, uh, right after getting my PhD and assuming my first academic position at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, to see the most charismatic figure of that movement, a guy named David Foreman, give a talk on my campus. And a wide variety of people came from around the area, uh, many of whom 
were a part of that movement, uh, some of whom were just, as in any university talk, uh, little or unacquainted with it, but had been uh, intrigued by the promotional efforts on campus. And he gave really quite the spellbinding uh, talk, and it, it reminded me in many ways of experiences that I had had in those evangelical churches, even with a certain kind of altar call. In this case, it wasn't that people were would come to the front and kneel at the altar, but rather he asked those who had attended to howl like a wolf with him, to feel their animal self within, to find the wildness within. And he was arguing that if we would recognize our own wild animal selves, like the wolf, then we would stand up and fight for the planet. Well, uh, I was immediately hooked as a scholar interested in social movements and uh, arranged to show up in a small clearing in the Shawamaga National Forest in, uh, in northern Wisconsin to meet these groups at their next outdoor gathering. And before long, some 30 uh, of these activists showed up in this clear-cut forest. And uh, the very first songs that they, that they sang kind of reinforced both the ethical themes they were promoting, um, the notion that the natural world is valuable apart from its usefulness to human beings. We, today in environmental ethics, we call this intrinsic value theory or biocentrism or ecocentrism, life-centered ethics or ecosystem-centered ethics. So they, they were being animated by this kind of spiritual biocentrism. And uh, they also had a critique of human behavior suggesting that human beings were driving many species to extinction. And they had a political strategy, uh, a political analysis combined with a strategy. And the analysis went something like uh, either democracy has become so corrupt that the corporations and politicians are just bent on destruction, bent on extracting everything they possibly can from the natural world, regardless of its consequences for non-human life. Uh, or there were even more radical uh, perspectives in the group that we needed to bring down industrial civilization itself uh, because industrial civilization, whether capitalist or socialist, is intrinsically uh, destructive. So as a person trained at that point in social ethics, you always want to understand what the facts are on the ground and what the moral values are that are relevant to them to figure out what sorts of uh, prescriptions and diagnoses you might uh, uh, advocate. And they were certainly proposing very provocative ideas, this notion of intrinsic, the intrinsic value of nature, that human beings were precipitating a massive extinction event, that our political process had broken down so badly that extra-legal tactics were not only permissible, but uh, morally obligatory if we were to reverse the wholesale assault on nature that was occurring. So I didn't take any of that at face value, nor did I uh, uh, buy it a priori, but I just set out to work out really my own environmental ethics, which I did not have an opportunity to do it even in graduate school because they weren't teaching environmental ethics in graduate school. So I, I took the opportunity to immerse myself in that movement, studying it both uh, through field work and uh, historically, looking at all the, the documentary evidence from their own writings to writings about them, to figure out whether I thought they, uh, in any of these areas, made sense or whether they, uh, whether they didn't. They also had a very interesting perspective on global social movements around the world, and they were arguing that oftentimes indigenous cultures and peasant cultures around the world had spiritual connections to nature that were very different than that of kind of Western industrial societies and that they were fighting to protect their lands and their waters uh, against the voracious appetite of global market capitalism. And I was interested to find out whether in fact, 
their perceptions of what was happening in the global environmental milieu were accurate. So in the early 90s, after encountering these groups, I began, I began writing about them in North America, but I also began to study grassroots environmental movements around the world to determine if the perceptions of the North Americans involved in the Earth First and Radical Environmental Movement were accurate with regard to them. And that led to a book called Ecological Resistance Movements, The Global Emergence of Radical and Popular Environmentalism. So I began to notice within the global environmental milieu, by which I mean the places where a wide variety of social actors who are deeply engaged with environmental issues, from politicians and um, uh, non-governmental organization activists, uh, scientists, uh, UN officials, and so forth, I began to notice the same sorts of patterns emerge again and again and again, same sorts of thoughts emerge, at least within a significant number of those people, uh, and ideas that, that really were, uh, were in, in significant ways in sync with ideas that I first encountered within the radical environmental milieu. And so the radical environmental movement became something of a muse for me in thinking about the global environmental movement. And in noticing these patterns after I had traveled widely around the world in a wide variety of contexts, I produced a book called Dark Green Religion, Nature, Spirituality, and the Planetary Future, in which I argued that uh, in the last 150 years or so, roughly the 150 years since Darwin published On the Origin of Species, a new sort of cosmovision, a new uh, worldview was emerging that was grounded in the uh, evolutionary and ecological sciences that displaces human beings from the top of some great chain of being and promotes a kinship ethics in which all life is understood to be related and that ethical obligations are owed to all life forms because we all got here through the same way, through the struggle for existence and through our empathetic capacities, we ought to be able to uh, have a live and let live ethics. In other words, to the greatest extent possible, we ought to allow other organisms to live and flourish. This sort of idea was also tethered often to religious terminology in which people would talk about the earth um, as sacred, or the biosphere is sacred, even the universe is sacred. Uh, and, and so after noticing these, these patterns, that this kind of intrinsic value theory emerging and being proposed as guideposts for ethical behavior and producing this book, uh, I also noticed that it wasn't just people who were uh, most obviously involved in environmental causes. This sort of, the sorts of feelings I'm talking about here, um, the sorts of cognitive or uh, conceptual ideas that are being, that were being articulated and that I've put under this dark green religion umbrella, were being expressed and promoted in a host of other ways. Um, by scholar, scholars writing in environmental history and environmental philosophy, and conservation biology, just for a few examples, um, to documentary filmmakers, including, but certainly not only, the great uh, British documentarian David Attenborough, to uh, the anthropologist Jane Goodall, uh, who I sometimes uh, refer to as the energizer bunny of neo-animism, as she tours around the world almost 300 days a year, urging people to uh, uh, to help protect uh, wild animal species around the world, uh, and also in a wide variety of the arts, music, uh, theatrical films, um, animated films uh, such as Lion King, theatrical films such as Avatar, and I eventually did a book. I thought Avatar was such a good expression of these sorts of uh, dark green spiritualities that I orchestrated a book about it that's just called Avatar and Nature Spirituality. So the animating question for my 
academic path has been, um, to put it a little flippantly, you know, what is it with the, the human animal? Why is it that we are so dramatically degrading the habitats upon which we depend and to whom we belong and aren't taking dramatic action to reverse that pattern? And why is it that some people are working ardently to do that in a wide variety of ways while other people seem indifferent? So in addition to trying to understand the people that are the most passionate advocates for the conservation of uh, biocultural diversity around the world, uh, I have sought through other research projects to understand what cultural hindrances there are among those who are indifferent uh, or even hostile to such conservation efforts. So there's a little bit of a primer on how I ended up doing the uh, somewhat strange things I do. It's a, it's a splendidly broad uh, career, anybody's envy. Um, I have a sense that you've got three things going at least, probably of 30, but three came out as I heard it. One is at a base level, you care about the planet, you care mm -hmm. about biodiversity, uh, these new religious impulses are impulses you find congenial. Mm -hmm. Second thing I hear is you're an ethicist <laughs> and you ask the question, is the critique <laughs> that is being leveled at uh, practices, uh, uh, you know, contemporary practices, is that a legitimate mm -hmm. critique? Is, mm -hmm. does it, is it overstated or, or fundamentally accurate? Are the remedies uh, draconian extreme or simply what's needed? Right. And that's, of course, what, what any ethicist would, would have to ask about an extreme opposition that would require uh, a fairly substantial modification of standing practice. And then finally, your scholar of religion <laughs> wants to see, how do I understand the patterns that are emerging here? as religious patterns, as similar to things like altar calls in evangelical Christianity or uh, the striving for salvation and redemption by putting on the new man or the new person that is you know, central to a certain strain of Christian religiosity, let's say. And I, I guess what I, I, I'd like to ask is this general thing, well, how do you see these identities, the, have I got the identities sort of right, and how do they, how do they interact <laughs> for you? It's, it's a, uh, it, it, you have uh, done a nice synthesis of some of the layers of my work. I mean, I consider myself first and foremost uh, an interdisciplinary environmental studies scholar which in some ways just means that I'm all mixed up. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in all the things you're, uh, you just very uh, uh, well articulated. So let's, let's look at these for a second. Okay. Um, the fundamental motivation for people deeply engaged in environmental issues is, is, an, uh, is an emotional connection to nature. I have long written about what I call spiritualities of belonging and connection to nature. This sort of language is all over. And that is often tethered to what we could call a, a deeply spiritual biocentrism or ecocentrism, you know, a life-centered or ecosystem-centered value system. Now, that affectively derived or grounded ethical premise is not something uh, that is easy to convince someone of simply on rational grounds. Um, and so we're, we're at least in the realm of kind of implicit uh, spirituality, if not overt religion. And so as an ethicist, it, uh, you know, you're always looking for what are the ultimate roots of a person's 
moral perception, and that's a difficult one to, uh, to convince someone of. Um, it's usually based in some kinds of experiences that people have. Some people in the radical environmental movement call the destruction of some place that they cared about as children by bulldozers for logging or for some commercial or industrial development. Some of them have joked that that's the gateway drug of radical environmentalism, the kind of outrage that comes when places you care about get destroyed. Uh, but there was always something in, in me when, when I see uh, a large clear cut and the mud flowing into the river burying the sands and gravels that the, that the fish depend on to spawn that just seems so obviously uh, out of sync and wrong. So I sometimes talk about the three pillars of, of, of radical environmental ethics. You know, there's, so the first is this deeply spiritual biocentrism. Uh, the second is an analysis of an anthropogenic or a human-caused extinction crisis. And when I first encountered these folks, uh, I was working for the California State Parks uh, and, and had a, a career as an ocean lifeguard and a peace officer within uh, that resource agency. So I certainly knew a good deal about environmental issues from, from that perspective. But I hadn't really been confronted with claims that human beings were precipitating what's now being called the, the sixth great extinction. So I didn't really know when I set out to study them whether their claims that were pretty apocalyptic about the human impact on nature were accurate. Uh, and now I've studied that a great deal for almost 30 years and became convinced that on the facts uh, they were right. Not only were they right, uh, not only were they accurate, they were among the first activists uh, on earth to make that their highest priority. So then we get to the question of politics. If, obviously, if, if your value system is that all life has value and has a right to be here, all life forms, but there's this huge gap, we're driving many species off the planet, there's obviously a huge gap between what ought to be the flourishing of all life forms, uh, and what is this massive human-caused extinction event. So politics is the bridge between the gap between what ought to be and what is. So they had a very radical critique. I mean, were they, so as an ethicist, at least a social or an environmental ethicist, you have to deal with what the facts are. Part of the facts were trying to figure out whether they were right about the extinction crisis. Another part of the facts that have to be analyzed is are they right politically? Are their diagnoses of what's going on politically accurate? And are the prescriptions they offer to ameliorate uh, those wrongs, to, to bridge that gap between what ought, what is and what ought to be, are those prescriptions warranted? Will they get us in the direction that we might want to go if we have these values and we know this gap between what's happening and those values? Um, now, so I set out to understand what was going on on the ground in especially North American environmental politics in, in the campaigns that the radical environmentalists were promoting. And a part of what they were arguing is that resource regimes in North America were corrupt, that uh, the, the United States uh, Interior Department agencies, such as the Forest Service and Bureau of Lands Management, were basically co-opted and subsidiaries of the great corporations and uh, there was a kind of revolving door between uh, the resource agencies and the corporations and that they were in fact being lawless with regard to uh, their own statutory obligations to protect the ecosystems that they were responsible uh, for. Now, as an agency person, I'm not the first one, I'm far from the first one to assume conspiracy theories about uh, resource agency people. I've worked in those agencies, I know those people, uh, many of them, uh, uh, I respect and like them. But when I began to look at what was going on, for example, on U.S. Forest Service lands, and I realized that many of the logging programs were going on were uh, actually losing money while corporations walked away with large amounts of, uh, of profits. So the taxpayers were subsidizing. At one point, 
a billion dollars a year to the uh, to these timber corporations, um, and when you see judges appointed by conservative Republicans repeatedly finding that the government was breaking the laws and the corporations, the logging corporations were, were breaking the laws, arguing that they were uh, acting arbitrarily and capriciously with regard to those laws, which basically means illegally and sleazily uh, with regard to those laws. You could see that the grievances, at least in no small number of cases that these activists were uh, articulating, had merit. Now that really isn't all that surprising when we look at uh, when we look at the profits involved. We know that human beings are quite capable of uh, corrupt behavior. Indeed, as we look around the world, um, corruption, bad government, and corruption is is rampant, and it's often related to extractive industries that don't really care about what they leave after they take their oil, their minerals or their timber. So when I looked at uh, how bad was it, was democracy in place and being effective? Um, were there patterns of uh, corporate accountability uh, in place? Well, in many cases there were not. So in the grand tradition of, uh, at least the, the grand tradition of civil disobedience, uh, I concluded, was ethically justifiable. And indeed, if done carefully and nonviolently, and if well publicized, and if uh, done with articulate spokesmen and spokeswomen who would uh, explain to the public what was going on, um, these movements could be uh, not only warranted, but effective in ameliorating, reducing some of the destruction that they were protesting. And indeed, if we look at the history over the last uh, uh, quarter century, uh, there are many examples in which some combination of protest activity and legal uh, and lawsuits, litigation, uh, appeals, have been effective in reducing destruction. So, uh, Somewhat reluctantly, I, uh, given my own background as an agency person, I concluded that indeed um, there was a great deal of corruption in these resource regimes that um, the protesters were ethically warranted to, to resist in the ways that, the, uh, in, in at least nonviolent ways. Um, but of course, some of these activists were uh, even more extreme and argued that uh, were they were advancing what are essentially uh, uh, anarchist, primitivist positions. It's, this is a, a perspective known in shorthand as anarcho-primitivism that suggested we should really go back to foraging life ways before uh, industrial civilization itself. Well, that kind of perspective in many ways has struck me uh, as fanciful, uh, especially as our numbers burgeon. Uh, to over 7.2 billion. Um, even if that were a laudable goal, it's certainly not something that's going to happen uh, near term. Uh, and it's hard to get much of a, a political program out of that. So uh, as we think about the, uh, the biological diversity crisis, which of course is also deeply connected to the cultural diversity crisis because wherever um, mass culture takes over places where uh, indigenous people are, those cultures get eroded. So there's a close connection between biological and cultural diversity. The conservation of one is often deeply tethered to the conservation of the other. Uh, I concluded that uh, the, the sort of anarchist branch of these environmental movements really didn't have adequate prescriptions because they really had no way to bridle uh, the big power agents on Earth. They had really no way to protect the global commons, the atmosphere, uh, the oceans. And for that you need, in an era of nation states, which is basically what uh, 
most of the world has right now, you need international treaties and enforcement mechanisms if you're really going to address the extinction crisis. So this movement that I first began to study in depth has been a great muse for thinking about uh, what are the fundamental moral values that ought to orient us to the natural world, what in fact are the human impacts on nature, and uh, what, are the, what are the causes of this destructive impulse by our species, and what prescriptions might help to ameliorate it. So anyway, that kind of tripartite overview of eth ethical values, what's happening ecologically and what's happening politically, uh, provides a framework for me thinking ethically about the issues in general and also about the social movements around the world that are trying to address these things. The prophets you started with tried to make as much of a mess as they could in the countries about whose actions they disapproved of. Famous performance art pieces of the prophets marrying the prostitute. That's what you've done. Running around in a shirt saying, You'll lose your shirts if you, if you pursue this policy. Um, and Thoreau, in his place, certainly got all the neighbors talking by going to jail. Then he had the Chautauqua speech about that. But he didn't have the internet. He didn't have hacking. Uh, he didn't have flash mobs. <laughs> Neither did the prophets. So the problem of an individual being able to throw a significant sized wooden shoe <laughs> in the mechanisms of contemporary anything is a problem, well, it was started with the anarchists, I mean, the anarchist assassins and bombers of the early 20th century maybe knew about that a little bit. But to some extent, it's Snowden, it's Manning, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's cyber warfare. Uh, I mean, now gradually, all sorts of, of people who would have been Prophets doing performance art, saying you won't cut down this tree unless you're going to kill me when you do it, uh, now realize that for perhaps a brief time, they can sh throw shoes in mm -hmm. mechanisms. Mm -hmm. They can't, presumably, shut the mechanism down permanently, but they can make an enormous mess. And that fact is, is one that I suppose every, everybody who sees an ab, uh, something of absolute value being destroyed <laughs> is take, has to take account of. I guess I'm interested in... I mean, you must have met these people, mm -hmm. or correspond the more known about them. The folks who have shoes to throw, <laughs> and a desire to throw them. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious about what, in which, what, given the time you've spent here, and the variety of experiences you've had, how you think about the dialogue with these folks? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, the um, I mean, just a little bit more on their strategies, or at least some of their strategies. Uh, what are you trying to accomplish? What are they trying to accomplish with sabotage? 
Well, it depends, on, of course, on the type of sabotage that they might be engaged in. So as I suggested earlier, there's more often than not, these protesters are using politics as usual, electoral politics and so forth. The next step is they try to mount mass movements of, so, of civil disobedience. And sometimes this kind of civil disobedience becomes performance art, as you suggest. Um, people, uh, photogenic people and uh, blocking logging roads, sitting in tripods that they construct to prevent the logging trucks from going in, or sitting in trees so they can't get cut down. But some activists have also, uh, especially before 9-11, and they strengthened the uh, anti-terrorism law to include almost anything these activists were doing and creating very, very long sentences for anybody engaged in anything resembling sabotage. They would, on a, uh, in some campaigns, they would disable heavy machinery, logging uh, equipment, for example, or they would drive metal or ceramic spikes into trees uh, to make the timber less profitable in a, in a way waging economic warfare against the, uh, uh, the timber companies that were going to take out trees in areas that they considered to be um, critical habitat for various species. Um, there are examples on the ground where these sorts of tactics uh, dramatically slowed down uh, uh, the timber company and the Forest Service's plans, which gave uh, the political avenues or the lawsuits time to halt the practice that they were trying to prevent in the first place. Now, more often than not, they lose, but there's been quite a number of successful campaigns. So you could, you could say that if you share that their view that the entire natural world is intrinsically valuable, you could say that those tactics were justified because they were successful. They helped to prevent the extinction of species that, uh, for all we know, once they're gone, we can't bring back, despite some talk these days about de-extinction of, for example, the woolly mammoth from DNA and so forth. This is another area we will, probably won't get into today. but. These, uh, while we find examples where uh, some of the more radical tactics have been effective, um, ultimately in the long term, the growing human numbers, the material wants and needs of those numbers, and the aspirations of those who are poor but aspire to greater levels of material comfort, if not wealth, and consumption, leads to immense pressures on these uh, ecosystems that's, that are not going away. So in some ways, the tactics deployed by the radical environmentalists to just halt destruction at the, at the point in which it is occurring, it's a stopgap measure. It's no solution. There has to be broader cultural transformation there needs to be, uh, both domestically and internationally, as I mentioned before, there needs to be uh, laws and or treaties that are respected and if not enforced to prevent uh, the erosion of, the further erosion of, of biological diversity. So now some of these folks are going, as I suggested, we have folks who think that it might somehow be possible to bring down industrial civilization. Or they say industrial civilization is unsustainable and it will collapse of its own unsustainable weight and maybe we can nudge it toward that uh, event a little bit sooner. Um, but the folks who are taking that sort of most radical position are, uh, are not numerous, although they're also not insignificant because, as you suggested earlier, it doesn't take a whole lot of people to make a big mess. Um, so, you know, if we care about these things, if we care about the, the biological diversity on the planet, if we, if we value cultural diversity uh, in the main, 
I don't think everybody likes all forms of cultural diversity, especially those who have uh, concerns about gender equality uh, and uh, equality among different ethnic groups. But generally speaking, uh, it, speaking uh, in general terms, I think everybody uh, can agree that we want uh, the fullest that, that, there, that there's beauty in the cultural diversity of the planet and if if these things are closely linked to biological diversity we would want to uh, work in concert to prevent the destruction of either hmm. what does one do with the fact that this is the sixth great extinction, if it is a great extinction. The natural world produced five more before it. The world we live in, which is to be celebrated and preserved by political action of the kind you're suggesting, arose because of would be unthinkable without the other five great extinctions. Nature, there seems to be a pattern of comets, right, right, <laughs> asteroids, things like that. I think they're talking 26 million years as the pattern for these events. The planet itself produces volcanic events like Krakatoa, you know, with some regularity. Not, I mean, it's not in, in human historical right, terms. Right. They're very, very rare in geological terms. They're like mosquitoes. <laughs> um, so how does that fact that the natural world is not like Genesis, a garden that's disrupted. <laughs> it's a garden that gets clear burned <laughs> in a fairly regular way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how does that play in to the religious and ethical thinking uh, about um, care of the earth, respect for the earth, respect for biodiversity, right. those sorts of matters. Yeah. Um, we are in something of a cosmic shooting gallery, aren't we? Where any moment, or maybe not any moment, but it's certainly possible um, without much warning to be hit by a, another asteroid that would uh, end life on Earth as we know it. And really what folks in the environmental movement are trying to do is to protect life on Earth as we know it. So if uh, the universe itself or earthly forces uh, themselves are capable of producing great extinctions, why are we so upset about the possibility or the unfolding one right now? Well, great question, right? Um, we have in our genome capacity for empathy and ethics. And this one, for the first time, uh, at least in terms of a, of a great and massive extinction, this one is the first one that not only are we precipitating, but we're precipitating in a way in which those of us who are paying attention know that we're precipitating it. When humans began to spread around the world, as exceptionally clever hunters, they drove uh, quite a number of species to extinction. Um, but you could say, to be charitable, they, uh, to use a biblical references uh, back to Christ, they knew not what they did. Uh, but it's also the, the case that in a lot of places where humans spread, after a while, they began to realize that if they didn't we might say, learn their manners in those places, their ecological manners there, they would 
overhunt certain species to extinction. And many of these cultures developed mores and taboos uh, to prevent just that. So we're learning creatures. And a lot of times that uh, those constraints on behavior that emerge in a culture were consecrated or made sacred by the religious beliefs and perceptions of a, of a particular culture. So we have, uh, through our empathetic capacities and our ethical sensitivities, we've uh, become increasingly aware of the destructive acts that we take, that it's possible to be too greedy, to take too much, and to dramatically erode the uh, the world's diverse habitats. Now we can say we should not do that for purely human self-interested reasons, for purely prudential reasons, akin to, well, we net, uh, as the ecologist Aldo Leopold put it, the first uh, first step of intelligent tinkering is, is to save all the parts. The principle here being that you never know when you might need something. Uh, you never know what organism actually holds the, the genes that can prevent the next disease or an existing disease, plague, or blight. So on a purely prudential level, uh, I think there's a very strong argument that can be made that we ought not to be allowing uh, the extinction of any other organisms. But I think there's other arguments there that, uh, that at least to me and I think many others, are compelling, and that is, uh, we all got here in exactly the same way, through a long process of biological evolution. Um, that process involves pain, uh, and what uh, Darwin once called the struggle for existence, and. We know life is difficult because we're in the midst of it, we're living it, and those of us who have developed an empathetic capacity um, don't want to get in the way of others that are striving to survive and flourish just as we are. So it's possible purely from an understanding of, of ecological and evolutionary science to surmise what good ethical behavior is. And I think a lot of people around the world are developing such sensibilities in, the, uh, in this age that is increasingly informed by ecological and evolutionary worldviews. And so while we can say, sure, um, there could be some natural calamity that we have nothing to do with uh, that will dramatically alter the biota on the planet. Um, this time is on our watch and we are ethical creatures. And so at least on our watch, we ought not to be the ones that precipitate this sort of destruction, this sort of extinction. And I, I could also add as, as uh, Dave Foreman, the, the most charismatic of these uh, Earth firsters in the early years uh, said when sort of posed a similar question. He said, "Well, I'm a chauvinist for this for this uh, epoch. I like the life here now, and uh, I'm not so sure I'm going to like uh, the life that will come in the niches that we create through our destru destructive practices." That's not a bad answer either. Yeah. The ultimate conservatives. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a very conservative uh, nature to conservation. You know, it used to be that this was that conservation uh, in America and beyond was not uh, so uh, divided along partisan lines. I mean, some of our, our greatest environmentalists in the U.S. environmental history um, were uh, Republicans, such as. Uh, well, Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> such as Richard Nixon. Uh, interestingly enough, we got a whole host of exceptionally valuable environmental laws uh, under his signature. 
I, the slowest comic strip in, our, in the paper I read is Mark Trail. And recently, there's an issue coming up where a tree farmer finds a pest infestation uh, in, his, in his struggling grove. And at the same time, some beavers who've been kicked out of their beaver clan move in and begin building a nest. They're both trying to make it. And in the, in the episode this morning, the tree farmer had just decided that the beavers were the enemy. Now, Mark Trail is very predictable, and one knows <laughs> that he's going to end up with empathy for those beavers <laughs> who are rather also struggling to it, especially since the thing that's, in tr that's trouble for him is that until his farm works, he can't marry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he can't raise, raise a family. Mm -hmm. And the beavers, of course, want to raise a family. And they're all struggling. And the question is, and of course it's going to turn out very neatly that the beavers are a solution to the guy's problem. Because this is Mark Trail. This is Sunday. Mm -hmm. This is the weekly uh, dose of environmentalism on the comic pages. Hmm. Now, this is a spirituality, one might call it a Buddhist spirituality in some ways, because empathy and compassion are so real. You might also say that it's the sort of thing that grow, the sort of attitude that grows out of a lifetime of scientific, you know, mm -hmm. observation. What, do, what does it feel like to be a beaver? <laughs> You can answer that if you watch him every day. So there's this whole strain, and there are a few people in this city, state, nation, a substantial number taken together, who think that. Mm -hmm. They probably are seriously outnumbered by the evangelicals and Roman Catholics and Jews who don't think that way. Mm -hmm. Although there are certainly Catholics and evangelicals and Jews who do think that way. Right, right. So here's my question. Where have you come to, be, to stand on the possibility that documents like the Genesis creation story can get to the heart of important issues about human, in human, uh, human dominance over the natural world. Right. Do you see, are, are you inclined to say, we've got to replace <laughs> Genesis with, with essentially the, the Mark Trail story? <laughs> They're just trying to make it. You're just trying to make it. <laughs> Can't we get along? Yeah. Uh, or is there, is there, I mean, it would be really cute if there was something powerful in the Judeo-Christian tradition, something that didn't have to be made up or, or hammered together that would suddenly energize this vast quantity yeah, sure. of evangelicals and Catholics and Jews and, for that matter, Muslims. I've been involved in uh, creating a society for the study of religion, nature, and culture, and I did an encyclopedia for the study of uh, encyclopedia of religion and nature, and a part of what we were trying to do uh, with my collaborators there was to figure out whether the world's predominant religions might be amenable to a much more dramatic uh, environmental uh, mission, you might say. And certainly there are those within those traditions that are ardently trying to turn them in uh, uh, more dramatically green forms. Quite clearly, those who are more likely to do that within those traditions are on the liberal spectrum. And by that I mean they do not take uh, wholesale or literally the sacred texts of their traditions. Um, so uh, conservative religionists of, of all these different traditions uh, are far less likely, in my judgment, to turn dark green, 
uh, because these texts are exceptionally ambivalent with regard to uh, perceptions about the natural world and our responsibilities to them. To turn those traditions green, the, the world's most of the predominant world of religions, they need significant revisioning and reconstruction. Uh, and you might put it this way, they need to cherry pick their own traditions. There's uh, streams of human, of a justification for human domination in them. Uh, Krishna with the, uh, wrapped in the robes of uh, dead tiger skins, for example. Um, the famous passages in the Hebrew Bible, which of course uh, is antecedent to Christianity and Islam as well, um, in which human beings are given uh, dominion over the earth. Uh, of course, there are also passages there that can be read in ecologically friendly ways, such as God created the world and at each stage of the creation he said it was good. And some Jews and Christians and Muslims look at the story of Noah, which they share and argue that, look, God wanted to make sure that all the animals got on the ark. Uh, but that's hardly a, an environmental fable because God apparently was unconcerned for the plants and uh, was willing to destroy most of all other species because one particular species, namely human beings, had aggravated him a great deal. So we could go on and on about these sacred texts and uh, pull out some of them that are amenable to environmentally friendly readings, and we can equally pull out texts that are indifferent, if not uh, hostile to nature. Most of the world's predominant religions, let's be, let's be clear, uh, involve some sort of hope for divine rescue from this world, or from its suffering, some kind of enlightened release from its sufferings. Um, the perspective of dark green religion that I've well, the perspectives that I've captured under this umbrella of dark green religion uh, are very plural, but they, they certainly involve more of a sense that uh, even these processes of struggle, including predation, all of this is a sacred process, um, and the biosphere is sacred, and we don't need rescue from this place. This is a magical, sublime place that is uh, in which it is appropriate to talk about as a miracle. This is the only place in the universe we know for sure that life exists. Uh, it's the only place, it may be the only place in the universe where life exists. This is the only place in the universe where complex uh, multicellular organisms exist that think about the meaning of life and that as best they can explore the biosphere, their planet, and the universe. Um, it's, uh, there's a very good chance this is the only place in the universe such complex multicellular organisms exist. Uh, so when you look at what's right here, uh, it's hard to conclude otherwise than that this place is exceptionally special. And to use language that's typically associated with religion like, this is a sacred place. Uh, this place is a miracle, and we are privileged to be in the midst of it. This kind of rhetoric comes out, these kinds of term, terminology, these sorts of feelings emerge naturally simply from an understanding, as the Monty Python uh, film on the meaning of life uh, once put it musingly, uh, how incredibly unlikely is your birth? Uh, how incredibly unlikely is it that you are here, uh, in this case, if you're watching this, listening to me, thinking about these kinds of things, thinking about what our ethical obligations are to uh, each other and to other kind. I mean, that's an absolutely astounding uh, phenomena. So I forget your excellent question that set off that riff, but uh, I hope it was speaking to it. Thank you.